Hi and shalom, I'm Jarv Clay 9 and this is a video about Purim or Purim, a Jewish holy time or a festival time of feasting and rejoicing and gift giving. And it's in the Bible. Purim's in the book of Esther. And everything you need to know about Purim is found there. All the themes of Purim are the same themes that you find in the book of Esther. Bridal themes, banquet theme, being pleasing to the king, meaning being pleasing to God, theme of intercession, victory over the enemies, the ongoing battle between the Israelites and the Amalekites, enemies of God and the people of God, and the enmity between them and the ultimate victory that God's people have. A major theme is the providence of God. Not one time is prayer or worship or even the word God or the name of God mentioned in the book of Esther and yet God's providence is so evident. And another really important theme is that Purim is a day like Yom Kippur and vice versa. Believe it or not, they're both a day on which all Israel is saved, so to speak. The book of Esther also has an eschatological application. So there are many revelations about the end of the age in the book of Esther and the role that the Bride of the Messiah will play. But first of all, when you read the Book of Esther, it's really clear that Purim is a celebration of the fact that a long time ago in the Persian Empire, a very evil man named Haman, 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 cast lots to determine on what date the Jews should have been annihilated. Basically, a genocide. Sound familiar? Anyway, it didn't work, to say the least. And if you consider yourself a Christian and you think there's absolutely no reason that you should celebrate Purim or even acknowledge it, well, you should because if there were no Purim, there would be no, there would hardly be a Jewish people. They wouldn't have been preserved and without them, there was, there would have been no Messiah. Besides, you should have celebrated Purim, so why shouldn't you? Purim is the Hebrew word for lots, as in lots or lottery. On the date that the Jews were supposed to have been annihilated, the tables were turned on their enemies. The Jews were allowed and able to defend themselves. And at their time of sorrow, at the time that they were supposed to be slaughtered, destroyed, annihilated, they instead had victory over their enemies, they had relief from their enemies, and the tables were turned. So their sorrow was turned into rejoicing their time of mourning into a time of feasting. And so that's like the whole point, that's the whole thing with Purim. And also it's prophetic of the fact that one day this world as we know it, with the sin and the evil, well, the tables will be turned, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. Um, after a time of great sorrow and suffering, all Israel will be saved. So the messianic age will come and the Purim is sort of a prophetic picture of that, something that the book of Revelation mentions, and I guess I'll just go there right now the seventh trumpet, Revelation 11. So this is right after the two witnesses have their three and a half years witnessing in Jerusalem. Um, the seventh trumpet sounds. And here it says, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks to you, Yahweh God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry. The same way Haman was angry at the Jews. And your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who revere your name. Those would be the names Yahweh and Yahushua, the sacred names that happen to be Hebrew names, and I'm not just talking about the, like, abbreviated forms, but their actual names. And the time for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. So that's one major theme of Purim, the transition um, uh, when victory comes from, from Yahweh. Uh, in this book of Esther, it was this ongoing thing for a year. So, you know, Haman issued this decree 
And it wasn't until a year later that they got their victory. And it wasn't until a year later that they got relief from their enemies that the tables were turned. You can think of it this way. So mankind uh, has been on earth like 6,000 years struggling, struggling in sin, suffering in sin. And that's also another reason why we know it's the end of the age because we're hitting like that 6,000 year end of that, which is the end of days. But anyway, for 6,000 years, man has been struggling and suffering under sin and a world that is afflicted by sin and death. And there has been, among the holy people who strive to live holy, the spiritual warfare. But one day, very soon, it's just going to end. Like that. This transition period between this world, this sinful world, and the world to come, the messianic age. So it's also about the transition period between the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble in the end of days, right before the messianic age. And just as in the time of Esther, there was the evil Haman who wanted to annihilate the Jews, there will be an evil man named, well, the Anti-Messiah, who will use the name Jesus. So I could say his name is Jesus. And I wouldn't be lying. I should explain myself. Yes, there's healing, saving, delivering, anointing power in the name Jesus. Now, in the present. But in the Great Tribulation, things get a bit more complicated. Well, see, Jesus isn't actually a name. It's a really bad, poor transliteration of an abbreviated form of the Hebrew name. So it's not even from the original full Hebrew name, but an abbreviated, shortened form that mm, is kind of sketchy. It's a poor transliteration at that. So when you say Jesus is an English name, that's not true. It's actually, it's a Greek name. And any form of the name, like Yesu, you could say, oh, this is an Italian version, French version, whatever. No, they're Greek. It's Greek. But actually, it's not even a name, so I can't really call it a Greek name. It's really just a Greek transliteration of a name. So all the names that, so all the name, so all the, ver okay. So all the versions of the name Jesus that we have today are really good transliterations of a really bad Greek transliteration of a Hebrew name, and it's not a name anymore. When it really, it should be from the Hebrew, and not just any old Hebrew, but the original Hebrew. So it shouldn't be, you can't say that the Son of God, the Messiah's name is Yeshua, it's actually Yahushua, is the full version. So when I say that the anti-Messiah's name is going to be Jesus, or is Jesus, it's actually, it's kind of true because that's the name that he will use. And so it's basically, Jesus is the, or will be, the rendered name of the anti-Messiah. And so, that means in the Great Tribulation, that name's going to have occult power attached to it. And so, you need to know the name Yahshua, or Yahushua, for then. The pronunciation doesn't matter as long as Yah is in the name, because that's the name of God. So, the name Jesus, which isn't really a name, has no meaning, but the name Yahushua means Yahweh saves. And there's all kinds of scriptural support for this idea that during the Great Tribulation you need to know the name Yahushua because the Bible talks about calling on the name of the Lord in that day, in the time of trouble, meaning the Great Tribulation. The Lord, all caps, that means the name of Yahweh. In the Great Tribulation you need to be calling on the names of Yahweh and Yahushua. Yahushua because it has the name of Yahweh in it. And it means Yahweh saves. So the Lord saves. Whereas Yeshua and Jesus don't. Don't worry, this video is still about Purim. Like I said earlier, the anti messiah will be a lot like Haman. In fact, much worse. And he will be worse than Hitler. And biblically, it would be seven times worse than Hitler. You cannot even begin to fathom how terrible it will be. But the whole point is to keep your faith in God. And there will be martyrs. There have always been. In the story of Hanukkah, there's lots of martyrs in, in the stories, I should say, of Hanukkah. Now, Purim is unique because there was really no tragedy on, us in the, on the Jewish end as far as the book, as far as Esther really goes into detail, even though there was this struggle for a year. Or you could say it went back to the time of the Exodus with Amalek, or even before that to Esau, his forefather. You could even say the time before there was time, preordained and it existed spiritually before the souls even came to earth. <clears throat>
but as I was saying about the Book of Esther and Purim, there was this looming disaster for a year, and then one day it was like, enough! And so it will be that way at the very end of the age. God's gonna say, enough is enough, and that's it. So that's, prophetically, that's that's a picture of. And also Purim has a lot to do with intimacy with God and the same stuff that this Song of Songs talks about. And being, you know, the bride of the Messiah and growing in holiness and intercession and being pleasing to God just as Esther was pleasing unto the king. So the bride, so the church really should strive to be pleasing unto God, but only, truly, only a remnant is really utterly pleasing and found blameless and spotless without wrinkle because they really strive to put God first. Only a remnant is part of the bride of the Messiah. Only a remnant has the same intimacy with God as is written about in the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, which is considered the Holy of Holies of the Bible. So there's only a small remnant who has that same kind of intimacy of the, of the holy place, the most holy place of the temple, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God's very presence dwelt. And of course, we have admission to that by the blood of Yahushua. And so, again, I'm still talking about Purim, the same way Esther was against the law to go unto the king. We cannot make petition unto God unless we have atonement for our sin in the Messiah. And not only that, but we are walking in holiness according to the same power that comes from knowing the Messiah, Yahushua HaMashiach. And, um, yeah, back to Esther. The, a year before she saw the king, she spent 12 months of beauty treatments and the events of Purim are actually stuff that happens later during Esther's reign as queen. So I'm talking about the year before she even met the king, before she was chosen to be queen. So she actually spent an entire year preparing herself to meet the king so that she would be pleasing unto him. And that's pretty prophetic. Six months uh, soaking in oil of myrrh, and myrrh usually has a symbolism of suffering, and there's a lot of suffering in this life for the people of God. The more holy you want to be, the more suffering you're going to have to endure. And the, the, the second half of the year was cosmetics and beauty treatments and perfumes. And that's also symbolic of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So I didn't really tell you the story of Esther, but I'm just going to go ahead and do that because, I mean, how can anyone explain Purim without telling the story of Esther? And by the way, that's one of the ways you celebrate Purim is by reading Megilot Esther, which is Hebrew for the scroll of Esther, meaning the book of Esther, the same one you can find in any Christian Bible and any Tanakh. Chapter 1. First chapter, basically, right, Persian Empire, King Xerxes, I guess Emperor Xerxes, um, as he's most popularly known. He has this huge banquet, and his queen, he calls her, summons her to come, but she refuses. Her name was Vashti. As punishment, she is basically excommunicated from the king's presence forever. But I've also heard accounts that she was executed. And he has a beauty pageant to get a new queen. And so he sends the message out to all the provinces and they gather all these young women and um, they have a competition. And for a year they're like preparing for it and finally Esther becomes queen. She happened to be Jewish, but nobody knew that. She was raised by her uncle Mordecai, so I'm in chapter 2 by the way. And Mordecai happens to uncover a secret conspiracy to kill the king. And so he tells Esther, who in turn told the king and saved the king's life. Unfortunately, Mordecai didn't get rewarded, at least not right away. Chapter 3. Meanwhile, this guy named Haman, Haman that I mentioned earlier, uh, he's like really like a megalomaniac. He's really up himself. So he's riding around on a horse, you know, and having people bow down to him. And of course, Esther's uncle, Mordecai, the Jew, refuses to bow to him. Rightfully so. Now, if Haman doesn't, you know, hate the Jews enough already, this makes him angrier. And so he devises a plot to annihilate the Jews. The Purim, the lots were cast to determine a date. And so the lot fell on the 12th month, meaning not December, but the month of 
Adar. And so then he takes the king's signet ring to make it official, and so then there's a decree that's sent out all over the empire, and, and the day that he decided to do this happened to be the 13th day of the first month, meaning not January 13th, but the 13th day of the biblical first month, meaning Nisan, which is like right before Passover. So it's made known that uh, about a year from then or whatever it was, that people could just go and do what they want with the Jews. So let me say it again to make it clear. The lot was cast basically a couple of days before Passover and the lot fell to a date that was almost a year later in the 12th month, the 13th of Adar. And so today, the 14th and the 15th of Adar are celebrated. The 13th was the day that the Jews were supposed to have been annihilated, but they weren't. Instead, they annihilated the ones that wanted to annihilate them. And so they celebrated the 13th of Adar. Coincidentally, there are some striking parallels between this and what this ministry, Almighty Menduah HaKodesh, Holy Ghost Fire, Last Chance Ministry, has been undergoing for over the past year in a war with the Bride of Satan five forms of the occult theistic Satanism Kabbalah, Wicca, Voodoo, and Shamanism the five major forms uniting as one with one purpose their stated purpose has been to kill this ministry take that to mean what you want but Elizabeth Elijah has been the recipient of death threats in various forms associated with this group of people who disguise themselves as Christians and rally and stir up a spirit of hatred within lukewarm Christians. Assembling them in mass, Elizabeth Elijah has been brutally, emotionally gang raped for over the past year. Their stated motivation has been, quote, because we can. Just as Haman drew lots on Passover, fully knowing the significance of Passover to the Jewish people, so too have these evil ones published a slanderous wicked website accusing Elizabeth Elijah in particular of all manner of crimes which she is not guilty of and calling her all manner of evil names, none of which apply. Over. And also, very intentionally, and this has been expressed, in fact, as a birthday present, to further harass her. As Haman cast lots and issued the decree for the annihilation of the Jews on the 13th day of the first month of the primary calendar then in use, and as the Jews began to fast and mourn on that very day, so too did Yahweh issue a decree to fast on the 13th day of the first month of the primary calendar in use today, the Gregorian calendar. Last year, January 13th, the fast was issued. And again, this year, in this season of Purim, we are asking you and pray for the deliverance of this ministry, for our victory, and yours. If you count this ministry a blessing, then please bless this ministry in return. The Bible says, He who receives a prophet receives a prophet's reward. And Yahushua said, He who receives me receives my Father. And he who receives the one I send, a prophet, receives me. And so what you do with this ministry is also what you do unto Yahushua. As Mordecai petitioned Esther to petition the king, we petition you to seek God in prayer for this ministry.